uh, right on time. So it is one o'clock uh, on the East Coast USA. You are in the same time zone, aren't you? Uh, yes. Yes, so uh, one o'clock for both of us. Uh, and uh, it is time for the webinar with the custom photo props. It's a unique challenge. And uh, so uh, Carrie approached us a little bit late. So at that time we thought we had selected all of the companies. But then when I heard about the project first, I was like, so what is she talking like? Wh what? I didn't even know that there is, you know, a company for something like this. But then as I started learning about it, it's actually a fascinating world out there. I mean, like literally, I didn't know it exists and it's, it's cool. It's, it's really interesting. And so and we've never had a company from this industry. I'm not sure if we'll ever have anyone so unique. And I thought, you know what, let's add this company to, to the list because it's, it's so different, so cool. And at the same time, again, it's a, it, it is a small company and uh, we like small companies better than big companies because the students who will be watching this webinar, who will be work, working on this challenge, uh, maybe some of them will ascend to the level of CEO of a major Fortune 500 company. But most of them uh, will be probably managers, company owners of smaller businesses. So at least that's what they want to do within the next few years. And so the reason we like the small companies is because today you are where they want to be in a few years. And so your experience, your challenge, the things that you go through, that's much, much more educational for them than, for example, learning how it works, you know, for a CEO of ExxonMobil, for example. And so uh, the company fits all of those criteria. So it's a unique, interesting product. It's a very interesting industry. It is a, a size of the company that many students may hopefully have in a few years. And so from this perspective, it makes it very interesting. So the way we will do it is we will start with an introduction of the company and uh, a little bit about the industry, about the company, about the uh, products it offers, and then questions and answers. And so I see we already have a few viewers live. So if you have questions, Brianna, Hayoni, uh, Sophia, Zaira, uh, if you want to ask questions, you can raise hand and you literally have a button for that. And we will let you uh, join the meeting and ask your questions, engage, engage in the discussion uh, face to face. Or you can click on a button uh, called Q&A, and this way it will pop up as a question for me, and I will ask it on your behalf. Or you can put your questions in comments, and then those of you who are watching, on, um, uh, who cannot watch live but would like to ask questions, just email them to me. And I already have quite a few in the email account, uh, but if there will be more, I will read them from there. And so without any further introductions and ado, uh, I will switch it to our presenter, Carrie Zilbert. Zilbert? And um, yes, the floor is yours then. Hi everyone, I'm Carrie Siebert. I own Custom Photo Props. We're based out of Buffalo, New York area. I've been in business since 2009 and it started once my daughter was born and I needed photo props for her shoot. Um, from there I had um, started to develop products and I was encouraged through my photographer that I was using to go into the industry. And at the time I was thinking, this cannot possibly become a business. You know, it was just like a craft for me. And I first started selling on the website Etsy, which is where independent designers sell on is like a third party site basically. And um, from there I had then started doing very well and had started on my website. And what we design and manufacture is newborn photo props. So products such as fabrics that the babies lay on, which faux furs or vegan furs is really popular for us. Handmade headbands, clothing. Um, we've had custom furniture made and I work directly with manufacturing companies all over the world to have these products made for us. I wanna have our company stand out and not be like anyone else. And that's why I wanna have our own designs. Uh, with that, there's obviously challenges working, you know, in different countries and then um, language barriers and everything like that and, and shipping too. Um, and uh, the industry for newborn photography, it's actually a very large industry, which many people do not realize unless they are a newborn photographer or they, newborn, or they know one, um, but there are hundreds of thousands of newborn photographers out there and they range anywhere from somebody who's just doing it on the side and you know currently has another profession to somebody who has a home studio or you know rent space and um, photographs babies there so uh, along with that since it is a large industry there's also a lot of competition that i have the majority of my competitors i would like to say 
is um, maybe a stay-at-home mom, somebody that might have just like one person working for her, two people working for her. Um, if that, some company, the majority of companies too, they don't have their products ready to ship. They're all handmade. These are mostly companies that sell handmade goods such as little baby clothing, hats, headbands, and they might only open up their shop once every two weeks and you know they have certain set hours until they sell out and those are companies that are seem to be really desired because they're very boutique very specialized in what they have my company um i would say it's you know within the the top 10 for sizable companies in the photography industry um and i think so, so carrie so I'm, I'm trying to better understand what the products are and let me share the screen here uh, tell me if that's so uh, if you see my screen now you see the screen with a lot of babies I wouldn't go to that could you go to my website uh, okay so, uh, so customphotoprops.com so I'm just trying to understand what those products are so so that's basically so that's the pro that's the place right yes so, so like all those furs that you see there those are all furs that nobody else has I pick out all the dyes the, um, the baby wraps, the clothing's made in shop, all the headbands are made in shop. And so you, you actually make them, right? So it's not yeah. something that you source and resell, you actually make these things. The things that are handmade, yes, we do. Some of the products, um, I work with manufacturing companies like the fabrics, those I have to work with a manufacturing company. Some of them are finished in the US, so the edges are surged in that locally, but I may have purchased the actual um, fabric from you know China let's say and and most of these products like for example this one here so that's only specifically for the photo shoot right it's not something the baby would wear afterwards right. yes so it's, it's just for, for a nice cute photo yes um, the majority of our products would be I'd say difficult for somebody to use it on an everyday basis even the headbands they're typically a tie back mechanism where um, you can adjust it to the baby's head and it's easier to get on and off, but that would be difficult to stay on a baby's head if it's just wearing it around all day because there's no elasticity to it typically. These are actually very cute. So, uh, yeah, that's very nice. And Thanks. I guess you can even probably, I don't know, I mean, when my kids were small, I, I guess you can even wear that sometimes, you know. For yeah, them. <laughs> so that set for an example that fabric I had made in overseas in China, and then I had it surged in the US so it could actually become a wrap because before it was just a big bolt of fabric. And then the headband, we had our seamstress had sewn it, and, um, and then our designer also had another step in the process with making that turban headband. Mm -hmm. And then the materials, so you still buy the fabrics and other materials uh, somewhere else, I assume, right? So it's not something that Correct. Yeah, we used to hand dye our materials, but we just became too large. It was too difficult to maintain that. Right. So, and probably, I guess it's always not only cheaper, but also you can have a greater selection, and I suppose you can just order whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, when you when you make your products, do you make them? You know, so you have like a where not a warehouse perhaps, but you have some sort of an inventory available at any time. It's not something that people order and you make to the order. Exactly. And that's how we differ from other companies. There's so many companies where you have to wait for it to be made. Um, and all of our stuff is ready to ship. It's very seldom that we have to tell the customer it's going to be a two day wait. Um, we try to have everyone's order shipped within 24 hours. And yes, we do have a lot of inventory. I have almost 7,000 square foot of warehouse and office space. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Zyra Garcia is asking a question, and I think, Zyra, it might be better if you join and ask it live because it may require some explanation. I'm no expert in this field, but I'm not sure if I'm fully understanding. So just raise your hand. We will add you to the, in fact, I can probably allow it to talk. So, Zyra, you should be able to talk now. Do you want to ask a question about those? Uh, yes. photography portions. Go ahead. Yeah, that'd be great, please. Yes. Hi. Hi. Um, so my question, Carrie, is um, um, I know I understand you sell the products for the photography, but I also wanted to know whether um, Photoprops also uh, does photography for, for these photo shoots or do you just provide props? We just provide the props. We do not do any photography at all of babies. Oh. Uh, for example, the other day I went to a local photographer and brought her props and she called in a test model to photograph them for us because uh, we don't do any of the photography ourselves unless it's somebody coming in 
and taking photos, you know, for us, for the product itself. Okay, and then just, just, to, just to add on to that, Carrie, um, the, does your company focus more on selling to photographers or to um, the people who want to be photographed? Yes, it's primarily to the photographers who are then using it with their clients, and they will keep these props for, you know, a year or so, two years, three years, and, until the trend changes. With photography in, in the newborn industry, the trends change so fast, just like in the fashion world. So I could get a product in and it could be popular for six months and then you never see anybody use it again. So that's one of the issues that we've had with inventory is that, you know, what's hot today might not be hot tomorrow. Okay. Thank you, Carrie. Yep. That's actually strange. I thought for some reason that it would be, um, uh, kind of, you know, timeless. I mean, if it's a baby wrap or something like that, I mean, like right. I thought, why would it go out of style? Well, the staple items are, so like our furs, though the colors have changed, so furs have been in style, let's say, for seven years. They started um, hitting the market, and but the colors have changed. Before, it used to be really bright colors, reds, blues, greens, and now it's very soft, pastel, natural colors. Yeah. So uh, that's where you've seen the biggest shift change, and also before years ago um they're never used to see babies in clothing now they make little rompers pants hats i mean before they had hats but now it's very intricate and a little overall that a baby might wear might be 70 dollars from a boutique store which is just for photos which to me is insane but it'll be lace embroidered absolutely gorgeous piece where before that was there was no such thing yeah. Can you tell us a little bit more about the competition? You said there are a lot of small kind of one-time companies and then there are some bigger companies. So how does it work? Uh, who are the competitors and uh, how would you compare it to them, I guess, in terms of the size and age and experience and whatever else? Well, the biggest companies that I compare, compare myself to is companies that also started about when I, when I did. So we're about in the same age category and um, they focus on... Uh, the one company focuses on backdrops a lot. That's her primary product line. And then she sells furs and wraps and little coordinating items, buckets and bowls that offset that or go along with the backdrops. And then there's another company that um, I would say is equal, equal to my size. And um, though I know they just downsize because they're doing slow with the changes in social media and stuff. But their products are, is the same. It's all like bowls, buckets, um, things that the babies lay in, furniture. Mm -hmm. uh, so there is an interesting question. So you say there are many small companies where moms just started for themselves and then kind of become a business. And yeah. it sounded like that's what you started doing. And now you're actually a bigger company uh, with employees and so relatively a well-established one. What was the secret of your success? Why did you progress to a full-size company and other moms don't? Um, I don't know if, if they want to remain small and you know they really value just being able to have a very flexible schedule. I just got aggressive with it because I wanted to do really well and make something out of it. And I just got competitive with other companies that were also in the space. And I want to uh, ramp up my product line so we could have higher revenue. Uh, how, how many employees do you have now and what kind of functions do you need, do they need to, to perform? So is it like one in sales, one in production, one in accounting or like what, what kind of um, competition have, would we have to have? I have six employees. I have a product designer and then I have another girl that she does product design and she also does our fur because doing our fur is a full-time job literally because you have to cut it all and everything. Um, another girl that does product preparation. So she will do the end stages of preparing the product before it goes out the door and she works on shipping. And I have an office manager which she pretty much just runs the office and she also does the shipping. I just hired a new girl which is part-time and kind of on a temporary basis based on how she does to help work on our e-commerce site so I can focus on other things because that's primarily what I've been in charge of is working on listings and all the sales channels. And, um, and I have a, also um, a photographer that I brought in, but she's just on an as-needed basis. Mm -hmm. Here's a very interesting question from Paul um, by email. 
Uh, do you consider eBay, uh, Amazon, or AliExpress your competition? Amazon definitely is. Um, eBay, we've never done much on there whatsoever. I really don't feel like people use it that much. Um, on there, we literally have five sales a month. And on Amazon, we were doing incredible on there. We were doing about $1,100 a day on average at our peak, you know. And then through Amazon, what through Amazon? Yes. Wow, that's was, that's quite impressive, actually. Yeah, that was through our fulfillment, and then also FBA. And what I believe had happened because we lost ranking on there, and now we're only doing maybe two hundred and fifty dollars a day. So it's a dramatic oh, drop. Still, impre still impressive, but so on Amazon. So the way it works there, so your ranking that what matters, right? Yes. Or, and, and, but how, how is it determined? Is it some sort of like, like an algorithm? Yeah, it's a, it's a very complex algorithm. So and can it's you also, pay them to be promoted to the top or how does it work? You can pay for ads, but in which we were doing, uh, we weren't in the beginning because we grew organically and we were doing awesome. And then as we noticed, okay, now we're, we're not doing very good. We need to start paying. And I had hired a company to work on that. And unfortunately with paying the company to work on it and with the ads, and then with the seller fees, we weren't making any money whatsoever. So we got rid of that company and now I'm not paying to promote anything. That's one thing that the girl that I hired for the e-commerce position is going to try to figure that out, but she won't be able to dabble into that for probably about two months before she gets to that. Yeah. Aspect. Several of the other companies uh, that are participating in Exculture this semester, they really wanted to explore more about how to sell on Amazon. Uh, so, you know, it gives you access to a huge audience, potential, you know, clientele, but uh, nobody, or at least they don't know how to go about it. So how difficult it is to create an account, what mm -hmm. percentage do they take, uh, things like that. So in your experience, was it hard to establish an account with Amazon and both of them? It was not hard to open up an account, but from, I'll tell you what, it's definitely not user friendly or favorable for the seller because the customer pretty much can get away with anything. I mean, they could literally buy a product, use it, stain it, right, right. Burn it, and get a full refund. Right, um, right. And also the interface, we don't like the interface whatsoever. It's very cumbersome and they're often changing our categories without our permission, which then makes it not be seen in search. Right, right, um, right. But yeah, at one point we were doing really well and then the issue was that I believe where it had come into places where I had, we were doing good. And I was like, oh, well, I can improve this and make us do even better. And so I read some articles on how to improve your Amazon store. We changed all, all of the tags, you know, the search engine part, um, which is part of their algorithm on all of our listings. And it was about that time that we started losing ranking. It just, it just kept rolling downhill. And I don't know if that was it, but um, that's what we believe had a big factor in it. And then Ever since then, China has come in and started selling photo props. So we have the issue of the Chinese market also stealing our images for their listings and, um, you know, selling it as their own product and it's not even the same product. And so then they would take an image of your product, but they have a similar one, but they would use your image yes. to promote it. Yes. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. And, and then you can contact them and say, Stop industrial espionage. <laughs> They don't follow by those rules. They don't oh. see anything wrong with it. So interesting, you know. Yeah. And then they're selling it for you know half of what we're selling it for. So they're getting all the sales. Right, right, yeah. There is another question from Zyra Garcia. She's asking, are all your company's products vegan? Are all of ours? Yes. Yes. Can you can you even apply that word to products? Like I thought it it was only about food, but I guess yeah. Yeah. So. Um, the main competitive product that we have, so our fur is our number one seller and that's what we're most known for. Well, the main competing product to that is animal fur. Um, so it'd be on a, a real animal hide or a shearing of a lamb bull. And uh, that the customers or photographers in general love that because it provides great texture. And that's something that I didn't want to sell and not, I'm not vegan. Um, but I'd like to help animals as much as I can. And that's one thing that I can do. I've seen too many videos of them getting harmed. So we were originally, you know, just saying it was faux fur, but then we realized how can we differentiate ourselves? So we changed it to vegan and it was amazing how much 
um, praise we get from customers like, oh my gosh, you're vegan. It puts more of an elite status on our product versus just saying it's fake or artificial fur. Right. Especially when it's something like this, when it's not necessary to use the real, you know, animal hides. Right. Yes. Geography. So what's the geography of your customers? We ship all over the world. Um, the majority of our customers come from um, the, the western part of the U.S., like California, that, and then Florida's more concentrated. We used to do a lot of business in um, Canada and then also in Europe, but shipping rates just keep climbing and climbing. I think they're three times what they were when I started. And then with that, and then customs fees that they have to pay after they purchase, it just really deters people from buying from us now. Yeah, so so that also means that you're open to selling anywhere. So for example, if there will be a student, for example, in Canada who believes there is a market there, or maybe in Mexico, or maybe even somewhere further away, and they believe there is a market there and there is a demand, uh, you are open to the idea as long as they show you how, and it works, you're open to selling it everywhere. So you're not- Oh, gonna... absolutely. Mm -hmm. I'd love to do that. And at this time, so most of the customers, I still assume, would be from the United States, right? Uh, what are the other countries where yes. you have Canada, some, some? Canada. In Europe. I actually have a gentleman that is purchasing our furs wholesale from us at a discount, and he's located in Brazil, and he says that they sell really, really well there. But he also has the issue of the fact that he's got to pay duty, the high cost of shipping to ship it to him. So I don't think he's making the margins that he wants, but, and he's even said, I'm going to go and just have this stuff made myself. But I think he's having issues finding a product as nice as ours. Right. Makes sense. Uh, Zyra, you have another question, which is a very interesting one, but since I know nothing about the vegan community, why don't you just talk and explain what you mean? Hi, Carrie. Um, so uh, I had another question regarding um, the, your vegan products. Um, I know that uh, as a per as a vegan person myself, I know that the vegan community is growing rapidly, right. and I was wondering whether you also focus your marketing towards the vegan community because I know I know that many times they will switch from using one thing to another just for the uh, for the main reason for ethics. And so I was wondering whether you also focus on marketing your products to the vegan community. I don't. That's something that I wanted to do, but I feel like I'm not equipped to do that. I'm not really sure how to go about doing that. And I did do a survey to our customers a few months ago and had asked them, um, you know, basically why do you use our products? And I really thought that a lot, a big percentage of our customers were using it because it was vegan or animal friendly. And it wasn't as big of a percentage as I thought. The major reason that customers are using our products is because their quality and they're dur you know, durable and they're also machine washable. And with animal hides, they're not machine washable, they're hand washable, which is more cumbersome and uh, difficult to do. But I definitely think that we should market to the vegan community. And um, like you said, I, I really feel that um, it could be a great asset to us and more people, I just don't really know how to relay that message, you know? And that's exactly where it's an opportunity for you, Zyra, and other students. If you guys know more about that community or any other segment for that matter, uh, if you can provide a specific plan, you know, step by step, this is how you do it, this is how you access them, that's the best way to find them, this is the type of the message, that's exactly what this project is about. So the goal here is to find students who know something we don't know, and you bring those ideas to the company owners and they take them, implement them, and everybody's happy. You get the experience, they get the sales, and maybe you even will get some sort of a position with them. We, every semester we have several students who come up with such brilliant ideas that companies want them on staff. Perfect, thank you, Carrie. You're yeah. welcome. And I was just at a trade show a couple of weeks ago, and we had several people come into our booth and like, oh my gosh, this is that vegan company, or you know, thank you so much for being vegan. And, and everything so people are acknowledging and recognizing you know that we're different than what are some of our competitors are who are selling animal based products yeah. advertising so how do you advertise now we go to two main trade shows a year and those are in beginning of the year um, each state has little statewide shows but they're so very small that it's just not financially responsible of us to go there um, and we pretty much do everything on Facebook, Instagram, so through social media sources. And that's including, so both your followers, but also paid advertisement, or you just yes. work with your community? 
Yes, we do. Um, we just hired a marketing company. They just started in the very beginning of January and they've been doing very good for us so far, at least much better than we were doing on our own from trying to do our own. Yeah, can I ask you about that? And I'm sorry, students, I'm monopolizing the situation. So with Excalture, we've been around for about seven years and we have a global reach when it comes to the universities. In fact, it seems like everybody who teaches IB on this planet at least knows about, about us. And so we never had to do any advertisement. Uh, basically, we just you know tell our colleagues through the Academy of International Business and everything's fine. But now uh, we decided to also open the project to children. And so we wanna create what we call the Sculpture Kids. And so they will be starting on Monday, the first group of, of students. And so we will have uh, about 200 kids uh, from like 25 countries, something like that. And so same idea, they will be working in international teams and we have interesting clients for them, uh, a chocolate company, a toy maker and a uh, school, um, they will be designing like a school, a, a school of their dreams. But the problem we ran into is how do we advertise to, you know, parents and school teachers? There is no academy of, you know, parents, like there is an academy of international business. And so we tried to advertise on Facebook and it was uh, semi-successful. So there were some results, but there were not many. Mm -hmm. And so we did it all in house. We found a few students who kind of knew a little bit about it. And so they do, you know, basically for fun and it seems to work. But now I'm thinking about hiring a professional company. And so the question is, do you think the professionals will do it much better than the semi amateur professionals? Like for you, did you see a big difference? If you find the right company, absolutely. So I was originally doing it myself for, you know, ever since they changed the algorithm format and ready to start paying for ads. Um, I was doing it myself and some ads would work, some wouldn't, couldn't seem to figure out, you know, what, what the reasoning was. Um, let's just say it wasn't working as good as I knew it should be. I had hired one company and I heard them through Upwork. So it was an independent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's company. exactly what we're trying to do. Yeah. So, yeah. So um, they did not do well for us at all. And um, I ended up firing them and I'm like, you know what? I really want to go with somebody who's local to me and we got to connect with them, meet them in person because this other company is from, I think, California. And um, they had did a presentation for me. And, you know, they've had clients, I guess, for like seven years. They have been with them consistently and stuff. And I've already noticed a huge difference. Of course, it's costing me, with ad spend, it's cost me $4,000 a month. But I'm having a way better interaction. My sales are going way better. And I think it's definitely worth it. Um, and our, and our, you know, for our company, because it's helped me bring money in, you know? Yeah. Uh, so it, it seems like it might work, but there is a difference from a company to company, right? Yeah. You got to see who's, yeah. who's experienced in it. So when it comes to advertising, then, uh, are you open to exploring other channels or maybe some ideas? Uh, so, I mean, at this time it sounds like it's primarily your website and social media. So if students came up with interesting ideas, uh, I don't know, uh, I'm speculating here, but for example, we had in the past, um, for example, a company that makes uh, toys for schools. And so they were trying to reach them through the normal channels, like, you know, TV, radio and stuff like that. But then turns out in some countries, there are, there are literally like professional associations of teachers. And you can just simply send an email through that mailing list and you get your exact, exactly your target audience for basically free. And so if students came up with some ideas like this, like maybe professional mailing list, lists in their countries, maybe some, I have no idea what those could be. You're open to trying new things, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I guess the, the important thing I keep saying that to the students is uh, that you have to provide enough details because what happens sometimes the teams would say advertise on Facebook or advertise via YouTube or, you know, create a community. So if you say that it's not useful because first of all, the company probably have thought about that. And second, the reason they may not be doing that is because it takes some time to figure out how to do it. And so the value from you would be if you um, explain exactly how it would work, how to select the right audience, you know, what links they need to click to create an account, how much will it cost, how frequently they should do it. Maybe even do some calculations on, you know, uh, how, how, you know, return on investment, conversion rate. And so when you provide all those step-by-step -step guidelines where the company can literally follow you, you know, your guide, then it becomes actionable, then it becomes useful. Simply saying, you know, advertise through this or place an ad there, not enough information to, you know, to, to make it useful. Right. Uh, pricing. So uh, what is your pricing strategy at this time? We see the prices online, but for me personally, it's hard to determine, you know, are they higher than the competition, slower? Uh, so what's your philosophy about pricing? 
I try to have fair pricing. The majority of our customers are really happy with our pricing. And um, a lot of times they'll say, oh, thank you for, you know, not being ridiculously expensive. Because those boutiques in that, that I mentioned before, they are much more expensive than us. I mean, I'd say we're more like middle of the road. We're not the cheapest by any means. We're not the most expensive. Um, when I price a product, I'd like to at least double what my cost is. So uh, let's say I get a wrap for $5, I'll sell it probably for $14, $15. And then, you know, obviously I have overhead and stuff. So mm -hmm. I, um, my cost of goods sold or my, um, um, what am I thinking of? Um, well, would, you, have, you have to pay for advertisement, obviously, you know, payroll, yeah. all that. So accounting. So I assume that's a lot of costs. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, are you open to partnerships in some cases and I'm not sure if it even applies to your business but um, in some cases the clients of uh, Exculture partners would specifically say we're interested in like distributors or, or retailers or perhaps a joint venture in that country with this company or that company uh, and so for them apparently that's the most efficient way to sell I'm curious if in your case it would be even feasible and if it is feasible if uh, students brought you leads for potential again distributors retailers partners joint venture would you be open to those kinds of uh, partnerships? Yes, definitely. Uh, is it so? But in your case, at this time, you, you sell directly, right? You don't work with any retailers. Correct. Right? We just have that one gentleman that I had mentioned in Brazil, uh, which he just resells under his own company name. And then we have there's a camera company in New York City called BNH um, Photo, I guess, or camera. And they sell under our name and they purchase it at a wholesale. Mm -hmm. uh, now, several students by email asked about the biggest challenges your company faces. So if you had, if you could remove a specific obstacle right now, which one would it be? That's from Melanie. And then Carol asked basically, what's your biggest challenge at this time? Well, um, up to a month ago, I would have said social media marketing, getting their name out there uh, because of, you know, when our customers see our, our products in person, they absolutely love them and that, but it's just hard to be seen amongst everybody else. Now, I would say um, that one of our biggest struggles is just not finding enough ways to distribute our product. You know, with, we had originally, we're selling on Etsy, we were doing amazing on there. Their algorithm changed. Um, so we lost all of our ranking. So right now we're literally solely depending pretty much just on our website which is hard because I have to, I feel like our only channel then is social media. I'd like to get into other markets and think of ways who else can buy our fur and we can still have a good profit margin, you know? Mm -hmm. um, it, so, so Amazon, if you're not listed like top one or two people don't even bother scrolling down or how does it work? Yeah. Yeah. So if you're basically not on the first page, maybe the second page, you're not going to be seen. And mm -hmm. at one point we would have like three listings on the first page. And now we're probably on page seven, 10, you know, 15. It, mm -hmm. um, it's yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Um, there are a few questions about you as an entrepreneur. So uh, questions like, for example, do you ever regret that you quit a you know, daytime job and basically started your own business? And then questions, what is the toughest part of being a business owner? Um, I assume the reason students are asking those questions, most of them, as you know, are MBA or uh, last or second last year um, undergraduate students. And I imagine that most of them want to have their own business one day. So they basically want to be in a few years where you are now. So I guess they are trying to get an advice from you, you know, what's the best strategy and is it worth it? Mm -hmm. I'd love to answer that. I love owning a business. It is the best thing I've ever done. I wish I did it sooner. Uh, when I was, I wrote it for my intro, but when I was in high school, I worked in a pizzeria and I just really loved managing people and trying to help guide the company. I mean, the owners there were very open to anybody's ideas or anything, but, um, you know, having the freedom and flexibility is awesome. But in the beginning I had for years, the first two years I had to grind hard and I missed a big part of my daughter's life. And that's when, you know, her first two years, because I was working from home on the company and, um, I'd be up until two or three in the morning working on orders and I'd have to wake up at six o'clock with her. So it was definitely a struggle. Um, but I, I gave it my all and it finally got to a point after, you know, 
two years where I had hired somebody. Um, but I absolutely love it. And I constantly have ideas where I'd love to start another company, but I'm like, how am I going to juggle my time and not sacrifice my family life? So not going back to eight to five jobs. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Some people joke that business owners sleep like babies, wake up every two yeah. hours, try and then go back to sleep. <laughs> there's, there's times like when business is really good, you know, that, it's not stressful at all because we have all of our sales channels in place. Orders are just coming in with no issue. And then there's, you know, times where it's hard to sleep at night because, you know, I'm having an issue with an employee or, you know, um, competition, just, just things of that nature. But mm -hmm. I would say the good times definitely outweigh the few bad, you know. Right. Yeah. I hear you. Yeah, absolutely. All right. I think I've uh, exhausted most of the questions. I have a few more emails, but it seems like those questions are repetitive. So we talked about them. So guys here who are live with us, uh, Anna, Brianna, uh, Sophia, Zyra. So if you have any questions, that's your last chance. Otherwise, we're going to be wrapping up. And so uh, I guess the only question I will ask, so what the student should focus on to make it most useful for you? So when they will be trying to develop some ideas for the strategy for your company growth? Where do you think is the biggest need? Um, what would be of most interest to you? To find um, different sales, channel, sales channels for our products, you know, such as Amazon, Etsy, um, that are gonna be viable and, and last a long time, and also different markets that we could enter. One of the things that I had written down is possibly getting into the home decor sector. That's something right. that I love to do. It allow us to go through inventory fast. Um, and our customers really just love our furs. They're so soft. And we've had so many people say, oh, why don't you make these into blankets? But I don't oh, that, know. That's the question. So, the, uh, so is it possible to turn them into other products, not just the photo props, but like home decor, like yeah. blankets? Oh, yeah, definitely. Like our furs, they would just have to be sewn, and they could be made into a pillow or made into, you know, an Afghan throw. Um, and even the clothing, if we wanted to, you know. But I don't know how stiff the competition is going to be because I can't be with selling right now one of our furs for a two yard piece. We sell it for $85. I can't sell a finished throw for $85 because it's right. going to cost me, you know, a lot more. So it's going to be a $200 throw. So I have to find my market who's willing to spend $200 on this. And also I foresee myself competing against home decor companies such as like Pier One or um, like yeah. West Elm and that. So I, with them being such large corporations, right. I would imagine it would be difficult to find my spot in the space. Mm -hmm. Here's another question, just um, since it's so new, I, I would like to ask it. Uh, have you considered outsourcing the production altogether? Um, no, we've had things, um, anytime we have things manufactured at all, it, it just always, we lose control of it and quality goes down or it's not what I, you know, want to be. I, I really like our hands in it and be able to put our own touches on it. Yeah, yeah, it makes perfect sense. All right. So we're pretty much out of time. Well, thank you so much then. So what we will do is um, uh, we will have another webinar then in a few weeks um, towards the end of the first track. And so for the second one, usually we try to have the format where we will have a few teams that will present their work to you or their ideas that they have at that time, they will present them to you and ask for feedback. And so it will be a few weeks before they are fully done. So this way, whatever feedback they receive, uh, they will still be able to adjust and, uh, you know, hopefully make a better, you know, do a better job. And usually the ideas, you know, the, the feedback they get is like, okay, this is very interesting work, some more on this. Yeah, this we tried, it didn't work. And so this way, it's general enough that other teams that are watching passively, not presenting, so can still benefit from it. And that's what we usually try to do, but then at that time, the late track starts. And so for them, it will be just the beginning. So there will be probably, again, a lot of questions and maybe even some repetitive questions. But again, those of you students who will have questions at that time, we will have another webinar. And then if you have any more questions now, just send us an email. We will forward it to the company and uh, we'll answer them by email. And uh, hopefully this way, we'll, you will stay informed. All right, well, thank you so much. Truly appreciate your help. And uh, yeah, so we'll be in touch by email and then live again in a few weeks. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Karen. Mm -hmm. Bye-bye.